I'd always had this secret burning desire to do something with a YouTube channel. In 2015, as you say, with all of this hype and the build-up towards The Force Awakens, I, I, I would give my left arm to go back to that time before everything went south, just in, <laughs> right. in general, just in, in terms of the world, it feels like. Because I don't think there was a period from November 2014 until the film's release where I've been more excited for something than I was for The Force Awakens. Hey everyone, welcome back to the React First podcast brought to you by Passion Fruit. I am joined today by the titular Simon Davies of his channel. My name is Simon. Uh, thank you so much for being here, man. Thank you for having me. The uh, the very well-named channel, as you can tell. <laughs> I'm very good at coming up with names. It's it's, it's apt. It's apt. So I, I, I know who, who I'm speaking to. Speaking to. <laughs> um, your presence in the community has been uh, apparent for me for the last few years just because I've seen you around a lot in the various sort of pockets of the community with like, you know, being on Johnny O'Dell's uh, reaction compilations a lot. Uh, I know you're good friends with uh, Brianna and Brittany from Phantom Reactions and Brent Spash and so on. Um, just seeing you kind of like pop up in like these sort of corners uh, was always a, a pleasant surprise when I would you know see you. Uh, and recently you've been across social media really popping up and just, you know, uh, it kind of sparked my interest. I was like, you know, what? I really want to get him on here. I want to sit him down, just talk to him about his journey, you know, everything's going on today. And uh, so that's what we're going to hear too. Just to listen to your your story. Yeah. Well, hopefully it's an interesting one. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, I'm one of those people. I keep popping up, whether you like it or not. I just somehow just keep my head above the water, and uh, I'm always <laughs> present for some reason. Right. Um, so yeah, well, I want to get to everything that's going on today. But let's start at the beginning, as always. Uh, which is uh. For you, the channel has been around for several years now with you, uh, going back as far as 2015. And you started with um, your first review was for The Force Awakens. That was the first thing you kind of put up as like a piece of like content for the channel. Mm -hmm. So Star Wars has been a very apparent influence on the channel and your interests for a long time. Uh, and I want to ask at the beginning of that, uh, what is your history with Star Wars? Uh, and also, I guess, like American cinema in general. Yeah, um, specifically Star Wars, it's it's some of my earliest memories. Um, going back to when I was probably four or five years old, um, sitting at home with my older brother and playing with the old Star Wars models, the little spaceships. And we used to spend hours just back and forth playing with them. And that's, I think, what got me into Star Wars in the first place. Right. And then... I've actually still got them, and they're in the cupboard back there. You might be able to see them. The two leftmost VHS tapes on that top shelf. Oh, wow. The yep. original despecialized editions of The Empire Strikes Back and The Return of the Jedi. I've had them since probably I was six or seven. And yeah. so I would watch them religiously, uh, play all of the video games when I was younger, um, Dark Forces, Shadows of the Empire... And so that's really what got me into it in the beginning. I don't have a lot of heavy memories around the specifics, but a lot of my youth at home was centered around Star Wars. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of American cinema, we used to, the family, every Saturday night, we would sit down, we would go to our local blockbuster, and we would rent the latest release or maybe something that really piqued our interest. And that would be our family time every Saturday mm -hmm. night. And uh, it was just whatever took the fancy of, of my parents at the time. So that was kind of my earliest um, recollections around Star Wars and, and kind of, you know, movies in general. And it kind of just went from there as I grew up and, and I started to develop my own taste in things. And that's that's really mm -hmm. when it, you know, sprung from there. All right. Yeah, I had a very similar experience uh, with Star Wars. I, I don't remember the initial inception point for me. Uh, it was just kind of always there since I was a kid. Um, and then likewise, uh, Blockbuster was always a weekend family <laughs> event for me, me and my family. I would always go there with my dad and pick something out to watch. And yeah, that was the, the early start of my sort of 
expanse into uh, cinema <laughs> i think though those born after 2010 probably think blockbuster isn't that thing that thing from that marvel movie yeah that, that one <laughs> exactly. time and it's like it was a pretty big thing back in the day yeah, it was the place to be. <laughs> um, and, you know, like I said, starting with The Force Awakens, you came onto the scene during that, you know, sort of start of the new Star Wars era um, that we're currently in for like the post-Disney acquisition. Uh, when you started the channel, were you looking forward to that new wave of content as like sort of the means to sustain it? Or is it just like, I'm just really interested in this stuff. I want to kind of jump into the, the mix here. Yeah, I mean, the channel itself, I, I, I uploaded a couple of videos in the years Pre- previous um sort of just tied into reactions of myself being at a wrestlemania in new mm-hmm. orleans and i never had any plans to do much with it and then in 2015 when i'd watched a lot of other people do things like reactions i'd always had this secret burning desire to do something with a youtube channel i never knew what i think at first i was thinking to myself i'll try a gameplay channel I'll try and, you know, make some entertaining content that way. And in 2015, as you say, with all of this hype and the build up towards The Force Awakens, it, I mean, it was a period unlike any other. I I, I would give my left arm to go back to that time before everything went south, just in in general, just in in terms of the world, it feels like, and just experience that build up again. Because I don't think there was a period from November 2014 until the film's release, where I've been more excited for something than I was for The Force Awakens. Right. And so when it eventually released, I think I'd already thought to myself, I'm going to do a review. Um, It was a little bit delayed, though, because I was unsure about how to to really go about it, and I ended up recording it on my iPhone. Mm -hmm. Um, So again, not a lot of technical expertise there at the beginning. And it kind of just evolved from there. The first month or so, it was a mishmash of different types of things that I tried. It was gameplay, it was reviews. And then eventually I did stumble on to reactions. It was specifically um, someone mentioning about the Star Wars Rebels mid-season two trailer. And they said, Mm -hmm. I think it'd be good for you to watch this. And so I did. And that's kind of where everything just went from there because I'd never seen Rebels, I'd never seen Clone Wars. And that's really what got me my start into that reaction genre. Right. Yeah, because uh, it, that was the, the next thing that was really uh, interesting to me was that, yeah, you started with like that, the Force Awakens uh, stuff, and then you pivoted, pivoted back because the first reaction series you did was the Clone Wars. And that's just really rare for me to see, at least in the sort of midst of like looking at all this stuff, is it's rare for someone to uh, be really excited for that new wave of Star Wars, but then have to go back and already, if they weren't already familiar with the Clone Wars and the Rebel series, that had already mm-hmm. been out for several years at that point. Um, I knew one person who was in a similar boat, and her name is Laura Kelly. She was a Schmodown player for the show that I work for. She's a very, very great uh, Star Wars trivia player. And it was the same thing. She, um, actually, not same thing, but she didn't know Star Wars until The Force Awakens came out. And then that sort of piqued her interest. And she just dived into everything, every, every book, every show, cartoon, whatever. Um, and so for you, going back to learn about that aspect of the uh, the lore through Clone Wars and Rebels, uh, I guess what was that experience like doing that on camera, trying to kind of catch up in time for like what was coming with that new wave of Star Wars content? Yeah, um, the first thing that really ran through my head was why did I not watch this when it came out? Right. Why has it taken me so long to uh, to delve into this? And I think the, the the shortest explanation is that when the Clone Wars was being released was around the time that I was at university. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was a lot of change in my life. And so I was really kind of not focused on, um, you know, the little things. I, I was just not really, I was more kind of heavily into my social life than anything else. And so I, unlike now, where I do have a bit more time to sit down and just be able to watch things, it was a very busy time. And so it kind of just passed me by. Um, and, you know, I, I know that obviously I've got a lot of Star Wars merchandise in the background. A lot of my content is Star Wars based and I am a huge Star Wars fan. I I don't consider myself an expert. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I sat down and watched your Kyle Katarn uh, interview and, you know, Kyle's obviously a great guy and he's got an immense knowledge of Star Wars and the same with Eric from Blind Wave. Mm -hmm. I'm nowhere near their level. (laughs) Um, You know, although it may look a bit like I have the same dedication, um, you know, I, I am... I don't know whether it would be apt for me to say I'm an extremely dedicated casual fan. Mm-hmm. 
right. <laughs> um but you know the games um really kept me intri- interested in it um and then when all the hype around disney buying you know lucasfilm and we start to get more and more news about the potential for the sequels i mean star wars has already uh, has always held a, a dear place to me from a childhood perspective and i think it was because it started to really bring out those feelings of childhood right. um especially at a time around about 2013 14 where i, I was quite low it was it was you know it was a tough period and so that really kind of was something I could latch on to. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it's it's just rekindled that kind of love of Star Wars that maybe faltered a little bit between 2005 and, and 2012. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, was there any sort of technical learning curve for you getting started with the reactions in terms of just like the editing, recording, uh, camera setup, all that? Um, certainly from the perspective of the way I presented the videos, it took me a long time to realize that my early videos looked awful. Um, not just because, um, you know, it wasn't necessarily the camera quality. I had a, an okay webcam, but I did not know how to light anything. I didn't really know how to properly, uh, properly record my audio. And so in those early videos, there's a lot of crackly audio. You can barely see me. Um, you know, so it took me a couple of months to realize maybe I should invest in some lighting. Maybe I should invest in a better microphone. I was quite lucky early on with copyright. Um, mm-hmm. Somehow none of my Clone Wars material got caught up in the Disney copyright, you know, machine. Right. And so it was probably a few months in before I really started to, to learn how to edit a video so that, you know, it was in keeping with fair use and and making sure that I was doing everything I needed to do to uh, properly transform a video. Um, So from a technical point of view, yeah, that that was definitely the early learning curve. And and so um, it did take a bit of time, but I think I got to a point where I was more confident I could present myself a little bit better on screen. Um, And, you know, whether that helped at that point, I'm not sure, but, you know, it definitely looks better now looking back on it than the early videos. Right, right. Um, and yes, yeah, so the, the Clone Wars and then Rebels, like this early Star Wars content was kind of the bread and butter of the channel like to start with in that first year. And then you supplemented that with uh, superhero stuff, like the comic book stuff, like Flash, Arrows, things like that. Um, was the superhero genre, the comic book genre, something that you were already familiar with as well? Or is it something that you were kind of exploring for the channel? Uh, yeah, definitely the latter. I was exploring it um, based on recommendations, um, mm-hmm. based on... Because that's exactly what had gotten me into the Clone Wars is from people saying, look, if you've not seen this, you should watch it. And that paid off because I I absolutely loved the Clone Wars. And so I thought, well, I'll see what things people should also, you know, think that that I should watch. The next thing was Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which was fantastic. And I already had, you know, a bit of a a background knowledge of, you know, Marvel and DC. I've never been a comic book reader, um, Mm -hmm. but I definitely... Uh, was open to the idea of, you know, dipping my toes in these universes and and in and, and sort of the characters and the shows that were coming out at that point. Again, I think it was right in the middle of the CW being at its prime, I think, right. around about 2016. Um, yeah. And so I was more than happy to give it, you know, a try. And I enjoyed all of the early content that came out. Um, I think Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., The Flash... I didn't start watching Arrow for a couple of years, um, mm-hmm. but then Gotham as well. So, yep. you know, it was definitely something that I enjoyed, um, but it wasn't something that I initially had a major interest in. So it was just, again, I was just looking for things that people wanted me to watch just based off of, you know, what do you enjoy? What do you think I would enjoy? And it was an, mm-hmm. it was an interesting collaboration uh, between me and the community I'd built at that point. Right, right. And then and you, again, you had the that rotation of uh, shows to put out but then on top of that you also were putting out um things like unboxing videos and uh weekly you know vlogs and rants about like things that you were going on in your life things like that i guess what was the sort of uh concrete strategy of uh wanting to have a, a wide variety of things to express yourself with um i'd, I'd say it's it's less about having a concrete strategy and more just about how i am as a person i'm always mm-hmm. chopping and changing um what i like to do um if you go and look at my channel over the years you'll see that the content always changes in those early days it was much more frequent 
Um, but I've always gone through phases where I've just been unsure about what I've wanted to really do. Um, yeah. And that just comes from me being a rather uncertain person and having these kind of flip of a switch ideas that, you know, might make me think, right, well, I've been doing reactions, but now I want to go to gaming or I want to do, you know, current events. Um, and then I flip back and think, you know what, I really miss reactions. I'd like to go back and do some of that. Um, so it wasn't necessarily that it was as much of a um, concrete strategy. And it was more just about testing the waters, trying different things. Because um, again, that's the way I kind of came into this whole thing was less about wanting to be a reaction channel and more mm. just about what finding what fit me best. And I was right, still right. for that first year trying to figure out what, what works for me. Um, and, you know, so there is a lot of variety in those early days. And, and to an extent, it's always been that way, but it's just settled down a little bit as years have gone on. Yeah, it sounds very similar to a philosophy I always remember from uh, Jordan Peele, how he expresses how he writes things, as he writes multiple projects at once. And his idea is always, um, his philosophy is follow the fun. You know, you do something as much as you enjoy it, then when it starts getting a little stale, you jump over to another thing that you have in, in the mm -hmm. works and you just want to do that for a little while. And it's just a guess, sort of having that variety of outlets to kind of follow, to keep yourself invested in what you're doing. Um, and uh, when you started branching out a little more, you eventually got to Avatar and Stranger Things pretty much like right at the same time. And those are two shows with like massive audiences, obviously mm -hmm. very passionate audiences. Did you see any sort of shift in engagement and involvement in your in viewership and audience once you've sort of hit those shows in like new territories? Yeah, um, specifically Avatar. Avatar, mm -hmm. um, you know, has a very dedicated um, fan base. And again, at the time, a show that had released... I think it must have been a decade earlier. It was it sort of 2008, maybe? I, I can't remember exactly when, but most certainly a number of years before I actually started watching it. Right. And so the people who, and, and I think, again, this, I think for a bit of perspective, 2016, whilst there were reaction channels and there was reaction content, it was nowhere near as saturated as it is now. Mm -hmm. Right now, you could probably go onto YouTube and find a reaction for any show that you wanted. Right. And back then, that wasn't the case. I think if we if we just loop back to Clone Wars, I think I was the first person to react to Clone Wars that I know of, at least on YouTube. Right. Um, because it just it was a growing genre, and so mm -hmm. I think with Avatar, it was a fairly similar thing. And when I did start to watch that, I found that the audience was extremely passionate, extremely dedicated, and I like that because the one thing that really keeps me going through these reaction series is the ability to engage with other people who have watched the show. They can fill me in on things either I might have missed or misunderstood. Um, you know, they can obviously go back and forth with me on whether our opinions match up on certain things. But right. having that dedicated audience there really does help. And that, that was a big thing for me with Avatar. And that's what made me kind of fight so hard for it when I started to encounter some issues with Capcom and not, not Capcom. Um, uh, Viacom, that's what it was. Viacom. I knew there was a com in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, when I started to really get some issues with them, it really made me want to fight to, to keep doing that because, you know, I was enjoying the show, people were enjoying it, and I just enjoyed the community. Um, right. And it's been that way with a lot of, you know, shows like that. But Avatar was one of those where it, I've got a real strong connection to it, not just because of the, the show itself, but the audience as well and the people who, you know, I, I sort of connected with through that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a, a very similar uh, experience to, uh, I think, what was the next step for you, which was like diving into anime as well uh, for the channel, which was you started with um, Death Note and One Punch Man. Mm -hmm. uh, those are two, again, really obviously popular legacy shows uh, in, in the genre and uh when you started that did you were you familiar with uh the with anime as like sort of a medium in its own right was it something you were also kind of exploring for the channel um i mean i knew of anime i knew of manga but i didn't know any of that i never watched it i never actively mm -hmm. engaged with it um again i was probably a little ignorant to you know the the dedication and the following that it had um yeah. simply because you know I, again when it came to anything in that form, I I was either just not interested as, as a youngster um, or was always busy with different things. And so I always knew it was out there and people were always suggesting it to me. And, you know, I, I kind of always wanted to at least give people 
um, you know, the ability to to dictate some of the things that I would watch, kind of that again, that back and forth of, you know, well, if you're coming to, you know, enjoy the content I'm putting out, I want to be able to find out what is it you enjoy so that I can kind of tailor it. And so when people started to suggest some anime um, content, uh, I, I, I said to people again, what do you think I'd like? And I think One Punch Man and Death Note were a couple that were um, put out there and... I just I wasn't sure what to expect, so I just thought, you know what, I'll I'll dive right in. I'll see what I think about it. And for me, I always preface whenever I start a new series, I always say to people, look, I I will never try and you know force myself to watch something if I'm not enjoying it. Right. Uh, so you know when I'm watching a series, if I enjoy it, we'll we'll push on with it, we'll have a laugh, and you know we'll we'll get to enjoy it together. But if I'm struggling, I'll let you know, and I might I might have to drop it. And thankfully. Right. There's there's been few shows that I've had to drop, um, but anime you know and, and One Punch Man was great, uh, Death Note one of my favorites, um, and you know I think I probably bend my way through some of those really popular animes quite early on. I think right. I would have liked to have stretched it out a little bit because <laughs> you know some of those early series are, are just fantastic. You know, uh, yeah. Full Metal Alchemist is just one of the best, and you know I I, I think early on I did not know the meaning of patience. <laughs> it's like let's just get out as many videos as i can get through this as quickly as i can because i'm really enjoying it and now i'm yeah. like well why didn't i just slow it down you know and just in, enjoy it a little bit more you know right uh yeah because it, at that time you did have a heavy rotation of of work going out uh, again with the superhero stuff star wars avatar stranger things anime uh, it was a lot you're putting out at that specific time uh do you remember what the workload was like for yourself in that era, like just trying to maintain that really, really rigorous schedule. Yeah, it it was tough, um, especially after I uh, I moved in July of 2016. I moved um, out of my parents' house um, and up to Scotland um, to be with my then partner. And at that point, I was working a full time job. Um, I was obviously involved in a full time relationship trying to maintain a full-time social life as well. And so trying to run a, a YouTube channel, which I was dedicated to putting out five to seven videos a week, was really, really tough. And, you know, again, hindsight being a great thing, I think going back, I probably would have slowed myself down because it was at a detriment to a lot of, um, you know, things, especially my social life and, and probably in the end my relationship at that point. Um and so it, it was made even worse by the fact that I had a lot of internet issues when I first moved to Scotland for the first year. Um, I couldn't get broadband, so I was left right. on really basic internet. And so I had a choice of either editing the videos in a really compressed manner so that they looked really bad, <laughs> or uploading them and taking three hours for a video <laughs> that would now take 15 minutes. Yeah. So uh, it was a difficult time. Um, but it, it was, it was, I think that, you know, a lot of people say it, but I don't think a lot of people really appreciate it until you've lived it. But, you know, making videos, even just reaction videos where you're sat watching an episode, there's a lot of work that goes into it behind the scenes. As I'm, as I'm sure you know, you're an editor yourself, so you know exactly how much work and how much time it takes to to try and perfect these uh, these videos, even if it's two or three a week. So, yeah, it was it was pretty heavy and and if i was to go back i'd probably slow it down a little bit yeah um and, and within that though you always kept the sort of rant or ramble aspect of the channel uh consistent that was always sort of another outlet you had to keep that keep that sort of free flow thought uh, and expression going uh amongst all the reactions and the other specific content um i guess what has it meant for you to have that sort of uh outlet for, for the channel um available to you throughout the years it's been great um, because I, I am an opinionated person, um, you know, for better or worse. And I, I try my best to not let it bleed through so much in, um, you know, the channel itself. Certainly on Twitter, I'm a little bit more free with what I like to say and, and criticisms that I like to make and just voicing my opinion in general. Um, but it's been really good to just be able to express myself on certain topics um, that, uh, you know, important to me, um, regardless as to whether I think anyone will enjoy them or not. Um, 
you know, and it was it was inspired a lot by um, and and to be honest, that there was a few things inspired by Boogie Two Nine Eight Eight, um, who you know was one of the early YouTubers that mm-hmm. I was a big fan of back in the day, and he had a very similar style. He would make videos talking about his life, making rambling videos, and and you know, although mine were a little bit more focused on current events. I always used to think that if I can find a way of talking about current events, giving my perspective and maybe just trying to, you know, open someone's eyes to a certain topic, you know, that that it's cathartic to me because it feels like I'm doing something good. Um, and, and, you know, it's just sometimes just being able to vent is a good mm-hmm. thing as well. Um, mm-hmm. So it, it, it was a tough balance of being like, OK, well, this is this is something that I realize a lot of people don't come to my channel for, you know, political views or current events, but at the same time, you know, it's my channel. So I'm going to, I'm going to do what I really want to do. Um, yeah. and it, it was, and it's been something that has been consistent over the years. And I think, you know, again, some people like it, some people don't, but there's nothing, um, insidious about it. There's nothing malicious. It's just, Hey, this is my opinion. This is a particular video. It, the, the topic is in the title. So if you're not interested, then, you know, probably best to give this one a skip but yeah i i I do like airing my opinions right um and not just opinions but also connecting with the audience on personal matters that you've gone through through your life Mm -hmm. um you know ups and downs uh that you've been able to share with them Uh, particularly with the relationship that you mentioned you moved to scotland uh and then you had that uh split with your partner at that time uh that you were able to share with the viewers Mm -hmm. and uh, i think that was uh to me, a real testament to what that sort of platform is for not just the viewers, but for you yourself, the creator, uh, because having that sort of uh, kinship with the audience to be able to express your thoughts and just in a way where otherwise they'd be very internal and isolated is like really important. I think that's kind of like the uh, best, uh, one of the best byproducts of having a channel in which you're able to build this sort of engagement with people. Mm-hmm. And uh, not to dive into like the personal details of you know what was going on there with your life, but with the aspect of being able to share that with us, the viewers, um, I guess, yeah, what did, again, what did that mean to you to be able to have that sort of outlet to share that time of, the, of your life with them? It meant a lot um, because if you, if you were to sit down and ask my family, they will say that I'm not someone who's very good at sharing my feelings um, or being open about issues. I'm, I'm quite a um, protective person and I don't like, it's going to sound a bit silly, but I don't like the idea of burdening others with my problems and specifically those around me. And because I, I think the fact that I'm talking into a microphone and looking at a webcam, even though I know that I'm talking to hundreds or thousands of people, it's not something that I feel like I'm burdening people. I, I'm, I'm expressing myself and being able to talk about my innermost feelings And specifically at that time when, you know, I I don't think I'd ever been more mentally broken at that point when I was going through that breakup. Because again, it was my first serious relationship. Um, It was a massive upheaval at the time because, you know, I'd moved countries, um, you know, to to be in that relationship. It was years in the making. And, um, you know, everything, it, it happened at probably one of the worst times because everything was going great for me. I was on the most successful diet I'd ever been on, lost the most weight I'd ever lost. You know, the channel was, you know, going along very, very nicely. And I felt like my social life was in a really, really good place in a job that I was enjoying. And then it's all kind of just like one day just changed. Okay. And so being able to sit there and just even talk about that to a camera and put it out there and then get the support back from the people that were watching and, you know, to a larger extent, you know, the people who I've made friends with through YouTube, you know, some of the, some of the best people I've ever met, um, you know, and just be able to get that kind of, you know, response, um, just people checking in, just people offering support, even if you're not someone who's going to take up their offer, it's still very much appreciated and it's nice to know there's people there for you. So it meant everything to me at the time. And I, I don't quite know how I would have handled that if I didn't have that outlet and that support back. So yeah, it was, it was a huge thing at the time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's not uncommon for uh, creators to find, you know, solace in that sort of dedicated viewership because you know them, 
they know you and it's like that sort of you know parasocial relationship like sure but it is i think it is uh valuable for things like this so you don't have to feel like you said alone you don't have to feel like you're burdening with someone with the approach of like hey can you listen to me this is like i want to express myself if you'd like to listen i appreciate it and people appreciate that sort of openness i think uh with the online platforms like this yeah um and uh that was honestly like uh, such a tumultuous time i think because uh Obviously, again, going back to Star Wars with everything with the channel, um, that's around when the Force, uh, not Force Awakens, uh, The Last Jedi was about to come out. And as you said, uh, that's when everything sort of shifted <laughs> with the fandom, with like sort of the <laughs> online culture of like how these interactions go. Uh, and I guess for, for you, uh, you weren't, uh, you know, a super big fan of the movie when it came out, but you expressed yourself, I think, very articulately where you weren't just bashing it for the sake mm-hmm. of you know, rage clicks, especially what we have now today with that sort of grift, I think a lot of, a lot of channels have, um, but you gave some real criticism, criticism about it. And then within the following year, we would see what that would evolve into with like the general, you know, sort of discourse around it. Um, so I guess for you, what was your, yes, your takeaway from the film, just personal coming out of it, but then how did you feel sort of seeing where the fandom sort of evolved into uh, moving forward after that? Yeah, it was a really strange time. Um, the I mean, I, I think, again, anyone that's followed me knows that I have very mixed feelings on the sequels themselves. Um, and I I am always very upfront and honest with my opinions. You know, if I don't like something, I, I'll, I'll give it constructive feedback, but I won't hide away from, you know, the fact that I didn't like it. And so when I put out that review, and admittedly it was four o'clock in the morning because I'd gone to see the midnight showing. So... Mm-hmm. My emotions were probably a little bit more raw than they would have been had I waited until the next day to collect myself. But I was in such a kind of state of like, what what have I just seen? That I just I had to sit down and again, very much like with when I'm when I went through the breakup, I just thought I just need to talk. I just need to just unload what my feelings are right now. And it was very strange because I got to experience a little bit of what that boost is like when you really delve into criticism because that remains the second most popular video on my channel and a lot of it is from unfortunately people who jump on that bandwagon because people like to see things get criticized Mm -hmm. and i think at that point it was less so about an agenda for people and it was more about you know a lot of people were genuinely upset with the film um, and, and as time's gone on, my, my view on it is very much mellowed out. You know, do I like it? Not really. Do I appreciate it if it's trying to be different? Sure. You know, I, I can appreciate it now as it is there. It is part of the Star Wars universe. It's never going to change. It's never going to be retconned despite <laughs> what anyone wants. Um, and so we have to live with that. And so rather than focusing on the things that we might feel were wrong with it, you know, I look at it and think, well, if I can compare it to, say, The Rise of Skywalker... It was It was at least tried to do something out the box, something different. And it did have a lot of positives to it. The cinematography was fantastic. Um, you know, some of the fight scenes were really, really good. Um, but if you were to ask my general opinion, I'd say, yeah, it wasn't a film that I particularly enjoyed, even to this day. And so as that year progressed and you started to see more and more people come out the woodwork and, and start to see more and more people feel comfortable criticizing things, and you saw how that got, a reaction and that did start to pick up pace if you kept that up it was something that i could have very easily gone down that road of hmm i've just gotten three hundred thousand views for a 20 minute rant about a film right what else can i do what else can i rant about what else can i try and pick apart to try and garner some of those three hundred thousand people back and you know i think i'm human like anyone else there is always that element to you that says what can i do to keep those people Mm-hmm. And at the time, you know, that is something that you try and push down and say, okay, look, we're just going to go back to making the stuff that we want to make. But I think, you know, for other people, they see it as an opportunity. Um, and some people have gone on to be very successful with it. You know, it's become an entire genre now to make content that criticizes and um, that has a particular agenda. And it's been very, very successful, unfortunately. And, um, you know, it, it's always been a bit of a weird one for me because... There does exist genuine criticism for Mm. things like the sequel trilogy, but you kind of get lumped in with 
you know, the people who, it, it's a strange thing because if you say you hate something or you don't like something, there's a tendency to lump you in with the kind of anti-woke, anti-Disney people yeah. and vice versa. If you say you like something like, I, I really love The Force Awakens. It's one of my favorite films. So if if I say that to someone, there's a chance I might get thrown in as being a Disney shill. Right. It's, it's finding that medium. It's kind of like saying, well, look, I can dislike something, but still remain objective. And I think 2017 to 18 was the period where that really started to blend and separate. And the people who, you know, they started to form sides and it became an us versus them. And I think it very much reflected the current political climate of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, with certain people getting elected, people feeling a little bit more brazen right. in their, you know, uh, opinions and feeling more, you know, sort of open to expressing them. Yeah. And I think the world in general has just gravitated towards that kind of content because that's what makes money. And that's mm-hmm. at the end of the day, that's what a lot of people care about is making money. But I, I tried my best to avoid that and just go back to doing what I did. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. You're totally right with uh, the idea of you know seeing those numbers you know go up with a certain perspective and being uh, uh, tantalized by the idea of like how can I keep that going? It's very much in Star Wars you know legacy. It's like very much like you're fighting the dark side, you know, like yeah. you're seeing the the temptation there of like what <laughs> what could be in the palm of your hand if you were to follow that route. Um, yeah. But I'm very glad that you uh, like you said kept an even keel on like your sort of disposition towards the films like the fandom in general uh moving forward because then shortly after that we would get the rise of skywalker which would end out the sequel trilogy and then the mandalorian which would sort of have like the new rise of like people being a little more invigorated with like the the brand again um and so moving forward with that with the mandalorian stuff like that what was that like um getting past the movies and getting more into like the tv side of things we've been in for the last few years it was definitely different um and it was refreshing i, I remember sitting there and thinking when, when it was first announced I'll be honest, I wasn't tantalized at the idea of the Mandalorian being the centerpiece of a TV show. Um, because I thought to myself, well, and again, this is me coming from a perspective where I, I've not necessarily done a lot of reading into legends. Um, you know, I've read a few books when I was younger. Um, you know, there's been a lot of content that I, I've enjoyed, but I've never really found myself fully dedicated uh, to exploring the Legends content. So I know there's a lot of stuff with Mandalore in the background that people really get excited by. And uh, at the time, you know, having not too recently come off of Clone Wars, which was very Mandalore heavy at certain points, I sat there thinking, I wouldn't mind something different, you know, maybe not a Mandalorian, maybe something else. I was very much in favor of it delving away from, you know, the main saga, delving away from lightsabers, delving away from the Force, and just being this self-contained thing. So that that's what really excited me. Um, you know, and John Favreau and Dave Filoni being the two heading up the series is another thing that said to me, right, I think this is probably going to be something different and good because, you know, we've seen what John Favreau can do. We know that Dave Filoni is a trusted hand when it comes to Star Wars content. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did feel like we needed that break away from, you know, the movies and just as it, as it was at that point, again, kind of, Similar to me, I, I would have said to, to Disney, look, slow down. Stop stop putting everything out so quickly. We, we realistically mm-hmm. should have had those sequel films over the space of a decade. You know, mm-hmm. we should be right now just about getting episode nine. Mm-hmm. Um, because if you throw things out too quickly, you know, people can lose interest. You can get kind of oversaturated and uh, there's a bit of fatigue, which I, I think is very relevant in, in today with a lot of media. And so I was kind of happy that we were just going to slow things down a bit. Um, but it was, I was I was intrigued. And then when the first trailer came out, I was like, okay, yeah, I, I I'm kind of I'm kind of on board for this. I like yeah. I like the look of it. You know, um, Pedro Pascal being you know cast as the lead uh, was again another sort of real moment. That I was like, yeah, this is this is going to be good because yeah. you know <laughs> what I'd seen him in, I'd really liked him in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So yeah, yeah, I was I was I was hopefully optimistic at that point in a time <laughs> when I think everyone was a bit like, oh god, here's another thing that people are just going to moan about, you know, or here's right. another thing that Disney might try and screw up. So you know, I, I was cautiously optimistic. Yeah, and at that time we got the first season pretty early on, um, 
right before the pandemic hit and then the pandemic comes and that's when i think tv in general for the disney plus shows and other things uh m- had a different impact on people's sort of input with them and their relationship with them because it's a time when people are really, really eager for sort of connection with one another, and having those shows, I think, uh, provided like a, again those like that kind of those water cooler moments where you could like get online, talk about them, the discourse around them were like were very hot. Um, especially, it was weird at the time because everyone again didn't have work, so people could be up at midnight <laughs> watching the shows as they were coming out, and everyone could talk about it right away. Yeah. Um, and what was your pandemic experience like? Experiencing that through the channel as well as like just the online discourse of things. Yeah, um, I mean, the pandemic was just a strange time for everyone, I think. Um, It was, I I think, as you say, uh, people became much more connected to those shows and to the movies that we did get um, because it was an outlet. You know, it was was very much about keeping that connection with other people when you can't physically have it. And I think as well for me personally, it was about having, um, you know, an experience that got you away from the current reality. You know, you got to delve into a world that wasn't in lockdown for half an hour or an hour. And I think that was another big thing for people was just kind of forgetting what was going on in the world right now. Um, I, I was still working during the pandemic. Um, I was working from home though. So I never, um, you know, really felt that there was too much of a change in my day-to-day life. Um, because I wasn't at that point, I wasn't going out much. Um, you know, again, I, I'm, I'm old. So I'm at a point where my friends from school have kind of either got their own families or they've moved away and we only get to see each other, you know, maybe once a month if we're lucky. Right. Um, a lot of my kind of friend group at the moment and at that time as well had gravitated to online. Um, so again, not a lot changed me on the day to day, but I think for a lot of people, it was something that you know, we really wanted to, uh, you know, not just because people had more time on their hands, but because they needed that escape. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm trying to remember what shows came out in 2020 itself. Because um, I think Game of Thrones had ended by that point. Um, and, you know, obviously the cinemas weren't open. I think we had a few Marvel shows here or there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, there was kind of this clamoring and, and I, I remember Kyle mentioned specifically that was his formative year because mm-hmm. he felt that everything came together in that year just through, you know, that, that kind of having a time on his hands and having that ability to engage with people. And, you know, I think that was true. I think it was a case of a lot of people were turning to, uh, YouTube and reactions. And I think that's when a lot of channels started because Definitely. people had the time. And they finally sat down and said, I'd love to share this with other people to connect. So it was a, it was a big year, obviously, for, for good and bad. Um, for me, it, it just, it didn't change too much. It was just, again, one of those years where there was some crazy stuff going on on the outside. I carried on just doing what I do, um, you know, and just trying to, you know, help others get through it. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if, mm-hmm. if my reaction content can help, then. Uh, I will continue to do that. But I think by 2020 is when I started to become a bit erratic with my upload schedule. Um, and that's kind of lasted up to to this day. Right. Uh, yeah, because in coming into this year, you've uh, pivoted a little bit where you are expressing a little bit more of your opinions, like we went talked about on worldviews, things like that, ongoing current events, uh, but also your personal journeys, like your weight loss journey going on right now. Uh, which has been really great to see. Uh, to uh, some, it may seem like a significant sort of shift, but it's always been indicative of how you, of course, kind of carried the channel. Is it, It's an outlet for you to express yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been a crazy year and a transformative year for a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I guess, what is your philosophy of being able to share those thoughts, um, I guess, today, now with the channel and, and an audience? Yeah. Um, again, it's always been important for me to have that outlet. And specifically this year, I, again, me kind of going through these moments where I become, you know, disillusioned, maybe, and um, that's been growing more and more. My disillusionment with um, YouTube in general, but also the reaction genre. Um, you know, again, I'm not someone who who will hold back when I feel like something is is uh, wrong, and I I see more and more people jumping on the bandwagon, and and for me, I I think there is a lot of people out there that either, as we mentioned earlier, are making content for controversy's sake because that's where the money is, that's where the views are. Um, Or there's a lot of people who are just insincere in their reactions. 
And so there's a lot of people out there that, um, you know, I, I mentioned this and I actually made a parody of it, but there's a lot of first time reactions to things that I just cannot possibly believe someone's never seen before. Right. And I specifically parodied uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, um, a first time reaction, because I just, I can't believe that someone who lives in a first world country has never heard Queen and specifically right. Bohemian Rhapsody before. Now, yeah. I, I might be doing them an injustice, and they may never have heard it. Somehow they've, through sheer astronomical luck, have never heard that song come on the radio, on the TV, in a film. But I just, there's that innate sense of there being something insincere. And I just can't help but feel that that's become more common. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of that's kind of where I've, I've had a little bit of a, a kind of issue and i feel like you know as i mentioned 2020 being a time when a lot of people started channels um it's it's become a very saturated market as i mentioned you know you can find a reaction to anything nowadays and you know there's so many different people out there people who are talented people who are really really good and really engaging and put a lot of time and effort into their videos and uh you know i i, I guess some of it is sort of self-doubt and thinks well i'm not as good as them so you know, why, why try to compete? And at the same time, it's kind of like, well, they're doing things that I don't think are really morally right to, to, you know, be successful. And I don't want to go down that route. And so for me, it's just become more about it being a hobby and it being something that I can do, you know, just to have fun and just again, to express myself and just kind of just again, slowly build up a community again. Cause I, I, I feel like, you know, during those years that I was a little bit erratic with my schedule, I did lose a chunk of my initial community. And so I, I think, you know, it would be nice to build that back up, but with people understanding, um, what my goals and my ambitions are and how, you know, I view, um, the channel itself and, mm. That's really where I've been kind of going back and forward this year. And, and as you mentioned, going through the, the weight loss and, and the surgery, you know, that was a, a big thing for me as well. Cause, um, you know, one of the, the, the big things I've documented is my struggle with, you know, my food addiction and my weight. And that's been another thing that I've really enjoyed just being able to document both the successes and the failures. Yeah. Um, but I just, I did feel at the time like I need to take a bit of a break to recover. Um, and so it's at this point now where I'm starting to think about what do I want to do? How do I want to come back? And I am thinking about implementing some reaction series, but doing it on a very casual basis and just continuing, you know, with those current event videos and just voicing my opinion. So it's, um, I'm, I'm happy with that. You know, that that's kind of the thing is that if you can sit there and say that you're happy with the content that you're making and, and the schedule and how your channel is going, then that's really all that matters you know right yeah, yeah. absolutely uh and in addition to that you've also just been very active on social media as we discussed earlier which is just expressing you being have that as a second outlet for you yeah. to express your ideas uh sometimes a little more fervently <laughs> mm -hmm. depending on what the subject matter is um and uh i spoke with my friend he's mentioned kyle Katarn about the same thing uh which is like the idea of uh being able to speak up against sort of like pockets of fandoms and other things in the world going on online when you see that there's a, some sort of abuse of a platform happening of someone who has a following and they're not using it for, you said, the morally just reasons of like what you think they should be using for with those type of numbers. Um, I guess what is your logic and sort of reasoning behind being a vocal opponent of toxic creators on, in online fandom when you see it? Yeah, it's... I don't know if there's necessarily any logic or reason behind it. It's, it's an innate feeling of, I have to say something, you know, if I feel something is truly wrong, then I have to, I have to speak up. Um, because I, I don't like, I, I, it's, it's this really weird medium where I'm trying to not be perceived as a clout chaser because, you know, very often it is the people who are much, much larger, have bigger audiences. And so there is a perception that if you go after them for a certain take or for a certain behavior, then you're just trying to go after them to boost yourself. Um, at the same time, I, I sit there and I, I look at how these people are perpetuating the cycle of what really is ruining YouTube. And that is, again, um, and it's not just YouTube, it's, it's the media in general. You know, you look at any news channel, no matter what the political spectrum 
And they will always choose controversial topics because they know that that will garner, you know, people to click. Um, the, the, the aim is to divide people. Because if you can divide people, put them onto separate teams, you can then bat for one of those teams or you know how to manipulate one of those teams against the other and you use it for your own, you know, kind of advantage. And that's what I feel a lot of, um, you know, channels are doing at the moment. And, and again, Twitter is a place whereby I, I try and not bleed that into YouTube because I just like to keep YouTube as clean as possible and onto larger issues rather than picking on individuals. Mm -hmm. Twitter, I'm a little bit less restrained um, right. because, you know, typically Twitter, it's sharp, it's sharp. You can just say what you need to say and be done. But I do have an unfortunate habit of replying to people who probably don't deserve it. Nice. Um, and so I, I just, yeah, I, I just, I struggle to keep quiet when I feel like something is just not right. right. And um, it's, 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 yeah, it's it's definitely caused me probably more trouble than it's been worth. But, you know, it, it satisfies me because I sit there and I think, you know what? I've said my piece. If one person can have their mind changed based off of what I've said, then, you know, I, I, I've done a job. And I know I'm, I'm probably shouting into the void with a lot of this stuff because a lot of people are too hard headed or too entrenched to have mm -hmm. their points of view changed. Um, but you have to try. At the end of the day, if we all just give up, then we surrender, you know, our conscience and, and to the larger part, humanity to these toxic elements. And right. we've seen what that, what's happened. Apathy is what caused 2016, mm -hmm. you know, both in the US and the UK in terms of politics. And we've been paying for those mistakes ever since. And so if I can do a little bit just to try and not make sure that we fall into that same kind of apathy on a social side, then, hey, I, 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 I'm guilty as charged for uh, for being a bit outspoken um, right. where maybe some people might be a bit more professional. And certainly, my God, if I if I ever get touted by a company and they look at my Twitter history and, and just the the back and forth I've had with some people, they might just say, you know what, we're, we're going to just I'm gonna leave you alone for a little while. Just, you know, right. maybe delete your Twitter history, <laughs> you know, because it's it's tough. It's tough because, you know, again, some people have some good points on the opposite yeah. side, you know, and, and it's tough when you kind of agree with them. But at the yeah. same time, you know, they're dicks. Sorry if I'm yeah. not allowed to say that, but that's, that's fine. You know, yeah. It's totally it's fine. Tough. Uh, yeah. But I guess so where for you, where is that line between having um, just a different opinion that you don't agree with and then having a toxic opinion mm -hmm. or take or stand that you can't abide by and you feel the need to step in? It's very much about the harm it does. Um, if I was to compare it to, you know, a movie opinion, by all means, have an opinion. If you like something, if you don't like it, for whatever reason, you know, doesn't doesn't matter to me if you like something or not. We're, we're going to agree on things. We're going to disagree on things. That's the great thing about people is that, you know, we're all different. We all like different things. But when you either try and use that opinion to push a certain agenda or whether you have a large audience that you have, you know, a lot of influence over and you push your opinion in a certain way and try to link it into other things, um, you know, that's where I start to have a problem. And and again, it's, it's about that responsibility. And if we're speaking specifically about, you know, social media and YouTube, people with large channels and large audiences have a responsibility to make sure that what they say is truthful, is not, you know, in any way kind of misleading and is not influencing people in the wrong way. And I think that's what a lot of people can't understand. A big defense of someone like Gina Carano is people saying, well, she has the right to free speech. And absolutely she does. She can say whatever she wants, but that does not mean that she's free from the consequences of when the company looks at her tweets and when she denies certain things like vaccines and the fact that 100,000 kids might see that tweet and think, wow, that Gina Carino, she might be onto something. You know, when you start to affect people like that without any basis of, you know, real science, that's when I think there's a problem. And that's when consequences start to come in. And I think some people can't tell the difference between that. They they seem to think that freedom of speech is freedom of consequence. And it's, it's, it's just not. And so, um, you know, by all means, I don't have a problem with someone if, you know, they have a certain opinion. They they have the right to free speech. But when their opinion starts to harm someone else, 
that's when I just feel like it's it's just not acceptable, you know, and that that's why it's very much all about, you know, speaking up against transphobia. You know, that's that's one of the big things that seems to always be on the minds of people. Um, and, and there's a lot of things that, you know, you, a lot of people who, you know, beforehand, I would have thought would be more sensible around these kinds of subjects. And and they're not. Unfortunately, when things are polarizing, it then goes from being a debate to an argument and then it just kind of devolves from there. So, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of how I try to uh, to manage it, because, again, I, I'm someone who finds myself in the middle quite a lot. Sometimes I agree with people who, you know, maybe I consider a little toxic. You know, sometimes everything has to have a grain of truth to it. You know, that there's always going to be something in an argument that you can pick and say, well, yeah, they have a point there, but they've either gone and twisted it or it's gone and, you know, just blown up into a whole thing and it's been taken mm -hmm. and, and just, yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a, a social media today is so complicated. Because right. nothing is black and white at right. all, and it's it's right. terrible. And I, I I don't know how we fix it. Is the question? <laughs> is, is the real dilemma? How do we fix it? Yeah, um, yeah. And trying to uh, speak your piece uh, in against that certain mountain of like the unfixable is like such a daunting thing. Like right mm -hmm. today, and uh, I guess what what would be you know each time you get into one of these sort of forays with people, um, what what do you think is the sort of the baseline? goal you feel you can hope to have when you have sort of like a public online discourse with someone about these things i mean the 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 hope is that eventually i can find out what it is that's caused them to to believe a certain thing maybe they've misconstrued something maybe they've misunderstood something or maybe someone's told them something that's not true and i can point them in the right direction and um, because you will find that a lot of people who um you know are unfortunately misled uh, done so because of simple misinformation that can be easily disproved um it's just about how open they are to believing it um you know some people are so ingrained in believing what a popular figure might say and, and their opinion that no matter how much evidence or you know how much you might be able to put across a convincing point of view uh they they, they just won't you know buy it because again they're they're either unfortunately quite naive or really just entrenched and so it's about trying to find those limits and there will always come a point where i'm like okay i'm not getting through to this person so i'm just going to try and disconnect at this point and and mm -hmm. that's where there's sometimes a struggle because you know gotta have the last word sometimes you know sometimes i'd be better off just blocking people but then i always think to myself you know what good is that going to do it's not going to help them um, you know, so it's it's just about trying to have that empathetic point of view, which I find a lot of people lack. Mm -hmm. Trying to put yourself in the shoes of the other person. Are they actually being toxic? Are they just young and misled? Mm -hmm. Is there anything that I can try and do to, you know, point them in the right direction? And even if it's just something small, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't have to be shifting their entire belief system. It's just putting them on the right trail to say, well, you believe this small thing was true about someone. Actually, it turns out it wasn't. So maybe there's a bit more truth to the things that you haven't believed, mm -hmm. you know, in this area or what this person has said, you know, and that's kind of the goal. Again, it right. might just be shouting into the void, but um, <laughs> at least at least it's it's something. And, and it gives me a little bit of, you know, sort of inner peace, I guess. Yeah. Um, but again, sometimes a little bit too much time on my hands with Twitter is not a good thing. Right. <laughs> um, but it's, but I appreciate it. I appreciate you seeing, seeing you jump into these things, um, because yeah, it's, it's tough. It's tough to, uh, feel like you, you when you're seeing something in, unjust and you want to speak up, but you, going into this solo can be very, very intimidating. Um, and so I appreciate when you are able to kind of like spit that up for the sake of others specifically, I think that's mm -hmm. the most important thing. Um, and to wrap things up here with like, I guess the channel itself, uh, what has been the biggest uh, consistent obstacle uh, for you managing the channel over the years? That's an interesting question because there has been a lot of obstacles. And I think, you know, a lot of people would say, you know, copyright is a big mm -hmm. one, but I have always found that, you know, copyright with the rare exception um, you know, can be worked around. It can be negotiated. Um, it, it's frustrating. Don't get me wrong. It really mm -hmm. is frustrating. But if you have to upload a video eight times, having re-edited it, you can get it up there. Right. Um, 
I, I'd say the biggest obstacle has, has been myself. It's It's been the inconsistency. It's been the kind of lack of drive for whatever reason. You know, sometimes it's been exterior reasons that I've had no control over. Sometimes it's been myself. It's just not been knowing what I've wanted. Um, whether, you know, I've really wanted to make this a career and give it a good go. And then, you know, maybe you have a bit of a bad patch and you kind of, you know, lose sort of your motivation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I'd probably say that, that that that's been my biggest obstacle is my own self-doubt and my own lack of, um, you know, consistency because I've just never really, again, maybe it's just from the get-go, I never really treated it as if, you know, because I didn't grow up wanting to be a YouTuber. There's, there was no such thing as YouTube when I, there was no internet when I was, was growing up, you know, for the most part. Right. <laughs> um, you know, so it was never like a childhood dream, but it was something that I thought, I, I would like to try this. I think that I have a lot to, to, to offer. And then it was kind of like always being in between, like, this is working. Let's give it a go. And let's hold back and try and work on your personal life. Or, you know, let's try and, you know, focus on the job that I've got at the moment. So it's always been me being stuck between those two worlds, between wanting to do the YouTube full time and giving it my all and trying to, you know, wrangle my actual real life and the social side and the job and and it's always been a struggle so that that is definitely the biggest obstacle for me right right absolutely um and then uh how do you feel you have grown with the channel over the years i've become more confident um again if you go back and look at those early videos um and it it is only natural the more that you are sat in front of a camera talking to essentially yourself at that time um, you know, you, you are going to be, I mean, at least I was quite timid and reserved. And again, that's why I'm not a huge fan of going back and looking at my early stuff because I do sound like I'm, I'm at a job interview and I'm, I'm very kind of nervous, but now I feel like I've become, you know, obviously a, a much more confident person. Um, I have a lot of, uh, you know, great experiences that I've gained a lot of friends, you know, that have been, you know, very near and dear to me. Um, there's things that I've tried that I never would have tried had it not been for YouTube and the people that, you know, were around, you know, not just the shows that I've watched, but things like D and D, you know, I, I'd never given D and D a thought up until I met a group of friends on YouTube who were all passionate about it. And, you know, I let them take me, into that world and I've not looked back since. And, um, you know, that's really kind of helped me become, you know, a a better person. It's really helped me deal with a lot of the big problems that life has thrown at me. And I think that's what YouTube should be about. YouTube should be about not yourself, but making those connections with other people, making those lifelong friendships, whether it be with viewers, whether it be other content creators, you know, it's, it, it's it's unlike any other platform. I think that, you know, 20 years ago, my mind would have been blown at the idea that I could sit down and just watch a vlog of someone who lives halfway around the world mm-hmm. and connect with them and just leave a comment and say, hey, that's a great vlog. How are you doing today? And forming those connections. You know, it's, it's, it's just mind-blowing. Right. Um, but, you know, ultimately... There's been a lot of ups and downs, but I'm undoubtedly a better person for it. And I've got mm-hmm. a lot of experiences, a lot of memories, and, you know, a lot of friends that have come from it. And whether it be YouTube or those people and those experiences, it has made me a better person, you know? Right. Uh, that might tie into our final question here for the main part of this interview, uh, which is beyond any financial or monetary value, what has been the most rewarding aspect of the channel for you? It, it's been the people. hundred mm-hmm. percent, the people. Um you know, as as I mentioned, uh, back in 2016, I started to connect with these other YouTubers, some who I'd seen before I started the channel, you know, who had followed and they, they became some of the dearest people to me, um, who've helped me through some of the toughest times. And, you know, we've, we've kind of grown, we've gone through controversies together. You know, we've done 24 hour live streams together for charity. You know, we've, we've done all kinds. We've, flown across the world to meet each other and um you know that that's been you know something that i just you like you say you can't put a monetary value on it 
Um, you know, having the people who have been there since day one, you know, people who I recognize every time they comment, you know, there's, there's a viewer of mine called Gaddix and he is someone who has been there almost every single video since the very beginning, you know, we're talking seven years right. and, you know, you just look at that and you just, you, you just feel so much appreciation for the fact that people are invested because it's very easy for someone like me, who's an introvert to sit there and think that, you know, no one would find you interesting or no one would care, you know, and just to see that people do and that people are, you know, attracted to your personality and what you have to offer. It's a hugely rewarding thing. You know, I just, I can't put it into words. It's, it's just been, yeah, it's, it, I, I wouldn't be the person I am right now. You know, obviously there's, there's a lot of things that you go through in life in general, but YouTube's been a massive part of that for the last seven or eight years. And it's, it's overall been a massive benefit for me. So, right. Uh, very beautifully put. I uh, agree 100% <laughs> with all of that. Uh, I appreciate you coming on today. I want to cut into our last uh, final questionnaire for the channel, uh, for the show. Um, just 10 questions down the line. We'll get right into them. Yeah. Uh, the first question is, uh, what is your favorite TV show? My favorite TV show, obviously this, this changes depending on what I've seen recently. But right now, as it stands, it's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., um, yeah. <laughs> and that's just because I gave it a rewatch recently and it still stands out to me as, um, a surprising gem, you know, something I never mm -hmm. expected to truly love or enjoy, especially the first sort of 10 episodes are a little rough. Right. Yeah. Once you get past those 10 episodes, folks, it is a diamond in the rough. You know, it's, it's better than any of the Marvel movies. I, I I'll <laughs> make that claim and that'll probably annoy a lot of comic book fans <laughs> it's a bold claim bold claim but we'll see <laughs> uh omni media is going through it right now for his channel and i'm i'm, I'm excited to <sighs> rewatch those with him <laughs> uh, i'm so going the journey again yeah <laughs> uh, what is your favorite film my favorite film um i it's definitely one of the lord of the rings films but i always go back and forth between the fellowship and return of the king and mm -hmm. um, again lord of the rings another big thing that i'm i'm a fan of and so I'd, I'd probably say on on balance it would be fellowship. Yeah, I see that. I think mine's Return of the King. Personally, yeah, I just, I just <laughs> love the conclusion to everything. Um, what stresses you out? Ooh, that's an interesting one. Um, yeah, I, I'd say my own indecision. I, mm. I I am one of the most indecisive people that you will meet, um, and so that it, it annoys even me when I'm sat there thinking I don't know what I want to do. I don't know what I want to have for dinner. I don't know what where I want to go today. I get frustrated at myself. And uh, if I was just a little bit more decisive, I'd probably save myself a whole lot of trouble. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, obviously lots of things stress me out, but that's that's probably the, uh, the biggest thing. That's a good answer. <laughs> um, what helps you relax? It used to be food, um, mm. when I could eat food. Uh, but now I'd probably say just being able to sort of relax into, you know, a very chill video game, um, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's Hearthstone um, or something like The Long Dark, which is, you know, an independent game that I very much enjoy. It's, it's games that you don't have to necessarily think too much about. Right. You just kind of relax, just watch, yeah. play, and that's it. You know? Enjoy the vibe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, what is a hobby or passion you have outside of TV and film? I mean, I'm huge into sports, um, football or soccer for, for those of you over in the US um, right. is probably my biggest passion. Um, and so I used to play a lot when I was younger, obviously, as my fitness kind of went down the drain, that stopped. But I've always been a passionate supporter. Um, I go and see every every game that I can of my local team. Um, stargazing. I really do like to go out and camp and just look at the stars because I'm, I'm hugely into astronomy right. um, and, you know, just exploring the, the vast realms that is the universe and trying not to fill myself with existential dread when I try and <laughs> comprehend the unlimited size of the universe and the idea that right. in a trillion years we'll all be gone and forgotten and none of this will ever matter. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Very, uh, very good uh, preface for any Mike, Mike Flanagan uh, joint. <laughs> <laughs> um, what fictional character do you relate to or just care deeply about? Ooh, that's interesting. 
what fictional character do I relate to? Um, more recently, I would say uh, Brendan Fraser's character in The Whale. Yeah. Um, for obvious reasons, you know, struggling with obesity and, and getting to see that portrayed on screen in a way that I don't think has ever been portrayed before. Because people, it's very easy to make judgments off of, you know, experiences you've never had. And I'm guilty of that. I, I look at people sometimes and I will make snap judgments and not know anything about them. And I think that for people who do suffer with, you know, food addiction and obesity, it's very easy to look and say, you're just lazy. You're just greedy, you know, and and the the advice is always eat less, move more. You know, why don't you just diet? Why don't you just not eat? And I think people struggle to comprehend, you know, how it is a vicious cycle. And uh, to see that kind of portrayed in, in not just a, a way that's never been done before, but in a performance that, you know, clearly was was fantastic by Brendan Fraser. Right. It, it, it moved me like nothing has moved me in a long time. Mm-hmm. And so that, that, you know, is the first thing that pops into my mind right now. That makes sense. That's a great answer. Uh, what would be your guilty pleasure show or film? Well, my guilty pleasure show or film? Um, I've seen this one get a lot of hate, and I never understand why, but Constantine, the film <laughs> with Keanu Reeves? Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, for someone that uh, is not heavily into comic books, I, I obviously can't appreciate how good an adaption it might be. Mm-hmm. I've just always been interested in the idea of heaven and hell being portrayed on screen. Mm-hmm. Um, there's always, you know, again, because I'm always interested in that kind of um, spiritual kind of uh, elements of it, and just seeing people's variations and their kind of interpretations of it. Yeah. And so when that came out, um, you know, I, I can see the problems, and uh, you know, I definitely understand why people might have issues. But for me, it's just always been like a film that I can just put on, enjoy, and right. just not see any of those issues. I mean, Keanu <laughs> Reeves for me, he's the same in every film. He's the same person, the same character, but I don't know why I just really, really like him. He's just such a genuine, <laughs> nice guy that yeah. I just really like him in everything he does. All right. Yeah. Uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I think that's just his, his philosophy right now. <laughs> yeah. And it works. Um, it works for him. Yeah, yeah it totally does. Uh, what show or film gave you your favorite experience with the channel? Oh, God. I mean... Mandalorian in in many places but I think you know as as a lot of people will attest to that the season 2 finale mm-hmm. um in a, in a in a time in a world where being surprised is extremely rare okay. and I, I compare this to professional wrestling which is another hobby that I've I've had in the past mm-hmm. because everyone knows it's it's choreographed and it's scripted and uh, the internet exists now to spoil things Right. it's truly a rare moment when you get to sit down and be genuinely shocked at something that's happening on screen mm-hmm. and to see Luke Skywalker and looking back now all of the evidence was in place through that through that series running up that you know when it wasn't was, wasn't and I'm spoiling this for anyone who's not seen it but it's been out for what two and a half years now <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, when it's not Ahsoka who's the one that takes uh, Grogu it's pretty clear it must be someone like Luke. There's not many other known Jedi, but then when he yeah. shows up on screen, it's just, just for me it was it was an emotional moment, and, and I, I can count the amount of times I've cried on camera on my hand. Mm-hmm. Whenever it does happen, you know it's a big moment, and that was one of those moments. And yeah. not not for any you know particular you know reason of you know oh this is the real Luke Skywalker or this is the Luke as he should be. It was just it was just great to see the Luke Skywalker that I associated with my childhood mm-hmm. kind of on screen again and and right. that was a moment that you know i got to share and you know people and, and seeing other people's reactions to that was just very rarely are the moments in star wars especially that everyone enjoys and that was right. one of those moments right <laughs> um and then what show or film do you wish you could erase from your memory and react to for the first time on camera avatar the last Ever. airbender um, yeah. <laughs> for for a couple of reasons, not just because of how good it is, but because I think, you know, again, I, I would go back and, and try to preserve the reactions in a way that I've probably not done 
a lot of those mm-hmm. reactions have fallen foul of copyright and I've just kind of left them. Right. Um, and at this point now, you know, it's, it's a bit too late to go back and try and fix it. Hmm. Obvi- I think with the live action show that we're, we're getting a teaser for shortly, I see that as an opportunity to, to rekindle that. But yeah, uh, Avatar, watching that, right. another surprise. You know, I, I sat there and thought, a show on Nickelodeon from 10 years ago? I, mm, I'm a little bit wary, but no, that 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 got me from the very yeah. beginning. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good idea. Yeah, we'll see what the, the live action show turns out to be. Maybe a little strike, you know, like you know, we'll strike twice. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fingers it. crossed. All yeah. the signs are good so far. Yeah. Uh, and last question here. What advice would you give to yourself, your past self, if you could go back in time when you first started the channel? Oh, how long do I have... Do, is this just a, is this a, in free words or do I get a full hour sit down? However myself? you feel, like, however you, whatever you think you would want to say to yourself. I, I would say to myself first and foremost, uh, be more confident, improve, get get a damn light, you know, so people can see your face. Yeah. Um, but don't don't force things too soon. You know, take your time. You know, you don't need to do seven to ten videos a week. Um, because people will appreciate it one way or another. And then I would say to him, you know that move you've got coming up to Scotland? Don't do it. Because not not just from the perspective of, you know, things going off the rails with the relationship. You know, you can you can try and fix that. But it really screws up the progress of the channel because you don't have internet for a year. So, you know, <laughs> right. maybe just rethink that. Or move somewhere right. that has internet if you're going to go up to Scotland. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, it it would generally just be, you know, take your time, slow down. Mm. There's no need to try and force it. And I think that's what I tried when I was first starting out. It was all about trying to to catch on to that momentum, thinking that if I lost it, I'd never get it back. And I think with YouTube, a lot of people find that there's lulls and there's highs. And it's just about taking your time with things and, you know, just finding what works for you. So that's what I would say. Take also, stop eating as much. <laughs> Fantastic <laughs> advice all around. <laughs> uh, Simon, thank you so much for joining us today. I really, really appreciate your insight on everything, man. It was great to have you on. Thank you. I appreciate, you know, obviously the uh, the time that we've spent here. And uh, I've really enjoyed the series so far. So I look forward to seeing who else, you know, you, you have on. And uh, hopefully people have enjoyed it as well. Yeah, <laughs> I definitely did. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, please like, subscribe, all that good stuff. If you're watching this on the newsletter, if you find it through the newsletter, please subscribe and share that as well. We appreciate any shares there. And we will catch you on the next episode. <laughs>